Hey guys, thanks for tuning in to the My Career Path podcast. Today I've got another interview for you guys uh, with my good friend Lane Roberts. Lane and I actually met back in December at a Gentry concert. Lane went from beet farming to a sales manager. Lane's never one to shy away from work and has gone all over the place, even having quite a nerve-wracking experience in Abu Dhabi. Thanks for tuning in. Hope you guys enjoy. Lane, just to kind of give a brief introduction to, to the audience as well as, you know, a little bit of me as well. What, what would you say are your biggest achievements? Kind of start off with your family. Just introduce yourself to everybody. Um, I, I have uh, six children. And from my first marriage, my first wife died 15 years ago. And, and I remarried 10 years ago. So between my wife and I now, we have eight children and we're expecting our 15th grandchild. Awesome. So, yeah, that's exciting. We're, we're really excited. And, and what about education? What kind of education have you kind of overtaken throughout your life? Um, I went to Rick's College for and got my associates and then went to BYU and got my, ma- uh, not master's, my bachelor's in um, financial planning and counseling. It, it was the first college to actually offer a degree in that about mm, 40 some years ago. What's your current position? Who are you working as right now? I work for a company called Dome Technology. We're a a small construction company uh, located here in Idaho Falls. But a lot of people say, why are you guys in Idaho Falls when you're really kind of an international company? We have uh, worked in 35 countries and we do a unique type of construction. So we don't really do construction hardly in the West part of the United States. Most of our construction is at mining operations or at ports or plants. So we do, we do a lot of construction around the world. So if you do a lot in ports, that is kind of a good question. Why, why Idaho Falls is kind of a little landlocked. Do you just do a lot of kind of moving around the country as well? We, we build a story, we build domes and the domes are reinforced concrete. They're not a metal dome. So they're, they're quite durable, but, Typically, they're used and, de- and designed to store bulk material, okay. um, especially like heavy bulk material like cement powder mm-hmm. and, uh, or explosive materials that are potentially explosive like uh, grains and, and wood pellets. There's often fires around those type of things, and, and the dome is very durable. And so it's, we've really kind of got a good foundation and we have a fairly good presence in certain industries in the world right now. Awesome. And how long have you worked at your, your position? I think you you told me you were a sales manager. How long sales have you been in that position? About 28 years. Yeah. I'm wow. going on 29. Well, congratulations. I think that's, that's awesome. Especially to be with a company for that long, you know, probably a lot of the ins and outs. You get to know a lot of good people, I'm sure. Yes. Yeah. I, I don't have to do a, a lot of um, marketing of myself anymore. Most of the work I do are come from relationships that I've developed over the years. So that, that keeps me pretty busy. The other guys, they're a little newer. Mm-hmm. They have to go out and find their business, but it's, uh, I, I'm kind of swamped off of what I've got. <laughs> You've built your network and now you're just working it and getting everyone taken care of, huh? Yes, that's right. Yeah. Gotcha. Yeah. Network. Perfect. Well, perfect. Well, I like to kind of start off these interviews with, with asking people kind of how they started. What was the very first job that you held? Uh, as an adult or ever? Uh, ever, ever. I, w- I want to know exactly where you started and kind of how you ended up just kind of marking that path. You know, I remember being in the fifth grade and talking to seventh graders who had summer jobs. And I was envious of them because they got what I thought was a real job. And when, <laughs> when I got out of the seventh grade, my brother and I, we headed to the beet fields. And then when beet season was over, we, we headed to the hay fields. The, the hay bales weighed half as much as I did. But being in a rural community in Wyoming, those were the jobs that were available. And, and I always had kind of an impression that those kids that were old enough to work. And back then, you know, if you're in the eighth grade, you were old enough to to work. And if Mm -hmm. if they didn't have a summer job, I, I thought they were a little lazy, (laughs) you know, and I, I didn't want to be in that, in that group. 
<laughs> so those were my first jobs it was mainly farming and, and then construction till I graduated and my I graduated with a degree in financial planning and counseling and went to work for a firm in San Diego. The financial planning was brand new at that time. Most people who did some kind of planning, financial planning, it was not fee-based, it was product-based. They either sold insurance or investments or something like that, where this was fee-based financial planning. Okay. And, uh, so we coordinated bringing in the attorneys and the accountants and the investment advisors and, and, and did the estate planning and, and stuff like that. And then after that, we got asked if we worked for uh, Allied Van Lines in the sales and marketing. And so I went to work for them. And it, this was in Billings, Montana. And, and that, that was a small market compared to Chicago, San Francisco, New York, you know, Miami, Dallas. Mm -hmm. And they, they offered something that was, it was called moving counselor of the year. And I thought, I'd like to get that. I, I really would. And I was told there was no chance that that was possible in the, the size of market of Billings. Mm -hmm. And so uh, I, I was dumb enough not to believe that. And uh, I worked hard. And uh, after three years, we really increased our share of the market. And I was selected as one out of, uh, there was four of us out of 1,400 salespeople for Allied Van Lines. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and, and that was a, a real defining moment because one, I was told that, you know, you don't even think about it because it's never going to happen. And I remember getting the call from Allied Corporate and, and just sitting at my desk and leaning back in my chair, putting my feet up on the desk and just breathing deeply, just bring, just taking it all in as much as I could. Just getting and, that sense of achievement, that rush, just kind it, of it, letting yes. it sink in. Yeah, you know, and and so that that was a, an exciting thing when I did that for 12 years. But then I realized that that was something that had a dead end to it. It, it wasn't, I, I didn't feel like I was able to really use my, what I thought my talents and skills were. Mm -hmm. And, and I remember when I was in college thinking, what kind of job do I want? I thought, you know, it'd be nice to have a nice corner office somewhere and be able to travel all over the world and, uh, and then get on the phone and make important decisions. Right. You know, that's, that's the thing that, uh, I entertain. Mm -hmm. Um, and then, uh, when I was about 35, 36, a, a friend of mine wanted to know if I'd go to work for this small dome company. Mm -hmm. And I remember my stake president saying, are you sure you want to do this? That, that, you know, <laughs> nobody knows about him, you know? And I go, actually, you know, I was a bishop at the time and, and, uh, he didn't, uh, he wasn't excited for me to one, take a position in a company that seemed questionable. Uh -huh. And, but I needed to move on and I joined them when we were living in California, we moved to Texas and, uh, we bought a house just South of Dallas and the first Iraq war began. And I was, uh, working for the, the company that actually sent me the Iraq, uh, Iraq war was finished and. And there was interest in, in our domes over in the Middle East. So I went to Abu Dhabi when wow. I got a phone. <laughs> yeah, there, the, the sky was still gray from all the, from all the uh, really? oil uh, field fires and stuff. Yeah, yeah, it was. And when I got there, my uh, sponsor wasn't there to pick me up. And so I'm in Abu Dhabi. It's two o'clock in the morning. And I'm walking around trying to find some help and, and, and it's dead. And I hear some voices and I walk into this office and I see four guys that were soldiers sitting there. And one of them looked official sitting at a desk and, and they were all equipped with machine guns and sidearms. And so I talked to the guy at the desk and 
And he said he didn't speak English, but he asked for my passport. And he took my passport and he looked at it and looked at my picture and they looked at me. And then he tossed it into his, the desk drawer and told me to leave. <laughs> and um, so I'm, I'm not sure, you know, what to do at that point. And I continued to look around and I saw a glass information booth and there was a young man in there spoke English really well. I asked him to help me, wanted to see my passport. And I told him, you know, they took it. He says, well, can I see your tickets? And this was a long time ago. And so, you know, you had your physical tickets and I handed it, shoved it under the glass and, and he took my tickets. And uh, now I didn't have tickets or uh, a passport. You're stranded in no man's land in the middle of the country where you don't speak the language and you're not sure what's going to happen. Exactly. Wow. And, uh, but it all worked out. So So did someone come pick you up? I mean, how did, how did it just work out? Well, about two in the morning, you know, there's no cell phones then. Uh And so, you know, I'm at a pay booth in the airport and uh, I called the office back in Dallas and said, you got to get me in contact with the embassy over here yeah. because you know, I don't know what to do. And, and so I'm standing at the pay phone when the embassy calls and they're not happy because I woke them up at two in the morning. Right. And, uh, and they said, call us in the morning if you have problems. And <laughs> I, I learned that the, the guy that was my contact was named Mohammed Nabhani. And I went to the, the white pages and, and all the, and they list the first, uh, the first name, Instead of last name first, it's the first name. There was like a zillion pages of Mohammed. It's, I mean, it is one of the most popular names. I think even still now yeah. <laughs> for boys. Yeah, that's right. And so, <laughs> but uh, they, they picked me up and, um, and then my wife called a few days later and said, well, the company just called and said, we just got our last paycheck. They're broke. And uh, so a couple I was over there 17 days and we went home and may I make a long story short. I, I went back to move, uh, working for allied band lines uh, for four years and then dome technology who I presently work with uh-huh. before called me up and said, would you like to come work here? And I thought this lightning strike twice, you know, <laughs> <laughs> and it's been for the most part since then, Colt and I honestly can say that, I love Monday mornings. I, I look forward to starting the week. And uh, a lot of people think I'm broken, but I think I'm blessed. Well, I, I, I would say so. And I think that's a, that's a sentiment shared by a lot of people is that they, they feel like work is just a, a job. And that was a, an episode I did not too long ago. I was talking about what makes a difference between a career and a job. And the job has that, I don't want to go to work. I just go in, I put my eight hours in, and then I go home. And whereas a career, you're excited, you're, you feel that contribution, you're working towards something and, you know, you're actually feeling like you're a contributing member. You're yeah. doing something important. Yes. So, yeah. I mean, that's fascinating to me that you, as far as I understand it correctly, you worked for Dome Technologies, then you went back to the van. Allied Van Lines. Actually, I worked for the sister company of Dome Technology, which was called Monolithic Constructors. Oh, okay. That was the original company and then the brothers divided. Okay, and that's, and that's when it went broke, and then you went back to Allied Van, and then back to Dome Tech, right? Yes, that's correct. Okay, all right, yeah. just making sure that I understood that. So you went from kind of farming to financial planning, and then you ultimately ended up in sales. Yes. What kind of, what, what do you think led you to stay in sales, and what did, what made, what do you love about it so much? People. Uh, that That's the key and uh, for me, and it's it's two groups of people. One is the customer, and two is the people I work with. Well, good. And, and what do you what do you do as far as a sales vendor? What would be like a normal a normal day look like? Are you kind of calling between people, making sure everyone has what they need, what projects are kind of overseeing? What's a what does a Monday morning look like to you? What that you look forward to so much? Well, uh, we start our Monday mornings off as a sales team. The person that's presiding over that is actually our CEO because he. He's not a micromanager at all, but he likes to keep his finger on the pulse. And so we, we individually sales people, we kind of spearhead the, the contact. We go to conferences and sometimes speak at conferences. We get involved in the writing of articles on projects that we have done. 
we kind of provide the guidance. We don't do the actual writing, but but we're the tip of the spear. And so when a potential project comes in, then we're the ones who start to prepare the scope of work that is going to be required. Mm-hmm. And uh, so we kind of lead a, a team and part of that team is vice president of construction, the engineering, somebody from engineering, and then our estimating department. So we kind of coordinate everybody's efforts, get them all on the same page. Mm-hmm. So we know we're all off, uh, singing off the same sheet of music. For me, that's a constant learning thing because we're evolving. And I find that my communication skills, I, I, I need to improve going up the food chain, so to speak, and down the food chain, you know. I, I like I like how you said that. Everyone's reading the same sheet of music. Yes. that's. I think that's a good I, – I was a band kid myself in high school, and that just makes the most sense. Everyone's going to the beat of the same drummer. Yep. We're all moving along. We're all going towards that goal. Yes. So for sales manager position, I know a lot of sales jobs, you, you know, I'm sure some people who are listening have done, you know, selling door-to-door like weed killer or selling – pesticides kind of thing like that is it commission-based or are you salaried yes i've done commission-based in past typically and this is the best for me is to have a base salary and then a bonus based on production Mm -hmm. and so i i've had experiences sometimes where and, and this has kind of been the genius of really our ceo is that Sometimes you'll get salespeople in your own organization competing against each other. Mm-hmm. Now, that's not good, you know, right. because we need to be a team. And so we all get a bonus based upon our collective production for that year. And so if we help each other be successful, then the bulk of our bonus comes from that collective wow. effort. And yeah, so it kind of puts everyone on the same page. We're all pushing the same way. Yes, and we're, okay. we're not pushing against each other. And so there's, uh, we want the synergy to be there because we're just that much more productive. And, you know, when, when the sales team, when you, everybody likes each other and gets along with each other, that looks after each other, it makes a big difference. And then, you know, there's some consideration that's given to individual production and and, and effort. And uh, mm-hmm. so that's kind of the frosting on the cake, but I've worked with people that they didn't care even if the company made a profit because they were getting paid based upon what they sold, even if it was undersold. That's something that I, I've thought a lot about. I, I don't know if you've read Good to Great by Jim Collins. Um, I have not. Huh? It's just a, a business book about how certain companies like Walgreens when Walgreens was first created and developed, it had, you know, various competitors, but Walgreens was the one that basically took that market and kind of became this great company that everyone knows. Whereas there's some other companies that no one's even heard of anymore because they just didn't make that leap. And that's something that he talks about in the book was the CEOs and the leaders of these great companies and successful companies were mostly people who said, I want the business to succeed. I want the team to succeed. It wasn't so self-focused which kind of in what you're talking about with the sales team, we're making sure we're all going the same way. We're making the same effort to to make something great to benefit other people. Because ultimately that's what business is, is working and benefiting other people. And, you know, the exchange of money and profit and things like that goes around, but we're working together towards the same goal. It's not so much of a a dog-eat-dog world, I guess, so to speak. Right. I remember, I, I mean, I'm old enough to have taken three classes from Stephen Covey. Okay. Yeah. So I was a real Stephen Covey fan, to say uh-huh. the least. And I remember him saying one time, he said, the world is not competitive in nature. It is cooperative in nature. He says, for example, try to build a house. If you had to go and grow the trees and cut the trees and go and make, you know, get iron ore and, and, and make your axe, make your tools and everything, you never get anything done. Right. And so he says, we, we cooperate so we can, you know, be more efficient, you know? Right. And so, well, it's, it's the, you know, the basics of economics 
We, we focus on what we're good at. I can make that, they can make that, and we'll work together to, to achieve more than we could by ourselves. So I think that's great. Yeah. How, how much do you think your bachelor's degree has helped you in your current position, your sales position? You know, I, I think it was a door, kind of a gateway. I don't think, I, I think anybody, you know, if, if they want to learn, they could do my job. Because there's guys that are a heck of a lot smarter than me that make crummy salespeople, but, and there's, there's, there's talent out there. Uh, and I, I think it's being persistent. So, you know, uh, I think getting an education, a formal education where you have a degree helps open doors, but I think you can still be well-educated and continuing on in your education without getting a formal mm -hmm. certificate, you know? Another thing that just as, as Blaine and I had briefly introduced and talked about when we were, when we first met, uh, you work pretty closely with some of the college students up at BYU, Idaho. Is that right? Yes. Yeah. So what do you think as, as those are, are people who are just about to kind of graduate, get their degree and go into the workforce, what do you think are like the biggest challenges that, that they face? I was thinking about that and I think the biggest challenge they face is themselves you know, they, they got to quit focusing on the, on themselves. I want this, or I want that, mm -hmm. you know, and I want to be treated this way or that way. You know, if we want respect, we respect people. If we want acknowledgement, you know, we share credit. I, I think sitting in front of a computer, you know, this during COVID, kind of changed the way we did things. We started doing a lot more teams or Zoom meetings, but we still have the philosophy that we got to get out there and look at people in the eye mm -hmm. and shake their hands and, and not get cozy sitting in our little office. And, and I think that's one thing with it, like engineers, a lot of them don't want to get in the field anymore. And I think they do themselves a big disservice by uh, not going out and going through with those who put the projects together, the contractors. And I, I think the biggest thing is um, really wanting to take ownership of, of their, their job and uh, focusing on being a good team player, mm -hmm. you know. Well, I always had my interview with, with Doug. He's my dad and he's the head of HR. He, he said a very similar thing where it's, there's, there's such a, a difficult way to network and kind of build those relationships, I think. And I think COVID and the pandemic definitely played a part of that. But I also think like social media and, and certain, you know, scrolling on TikTok and whatnot, it made us so reclusive and kind of, I, I need to keep to myself and my family. And it made it really difficult to just try to, you know, build this network and kind of build the people around that you can trust that you can work with, because ultimately we have to, like, like we were saying earlier, if you're going to cut a tree down, you need an ax, you need to be able to procure the blade, sharpen it and everything else. And, and building that team that can kind of help us all move forward and progress towards more, I think is, is more important than ever. Yeah, I do too. And, and something that I think applies across the board, not just business, but our, our personal lives and family mm -hmm. lives. And I encourage the youth, uh, the young single adults that I work with is to do anonymous good things for people. One, it, it, it benefits their mental health yeah. because they, they'll come back and, 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 you know, and I watch and keep a, an eye on them. And if I give them a challenge to uh, go do something good for somebody, then I follow up mm -hmm. and uh, see how they feel and, 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 you know, kind of the repercussions of what they did. And it, it, it changes them. That's one thing that I have been good about in my life, both with family and friends and people I work with is to become involved with their per with them personally. If I know mm -hmm. they're struggling from cancer and, and they live halfway across the country, I, I'll check in on them occasionally to see how they're doing. Has nothing to do with business, you know, yeah. but it has everything to do with business. And um, can I share a story? Yeah, absolutely. Okay. This guy, I, I was told one time by an associate of his, if a bunch of people are standing in the room, he'll always be the smartest guy in the room. 
And I go, yeah, I believe that, you know, he's a bright guy. And, and we had some, some business things going on and I was very impressed with his candor and he was a gentleman. And I wrote him a note one day. I just, I just felt like, okay, who could I reach out to today? And I wrote him a, an email that said, Hey, you know, Tim, I just want you to know that I, I admire you. I think you're a great family man. I think you're just a, a great guy and you have a lot of integrity. And I hope you have a good day. I never heard back from him. And I thought, oh, maybe, maybe I made him feel uncomfortable or something. And uh, it was about a year later, I was at a conference and I saw him walk by and I could tell he was kind of not ignoring me, but he, he didn't want to engage. And mm -hmm. uh, so, <laughs> Uh, a little while later, I, I ran into him and he, he apologized and he said this, he said, uh, I should, he said, I should have replied to your email, uh, but I didn't, but I just want you to know that I needed that email so bad that day, wow. you know, I mean, what do they say? You run half the people that you run into are really having difficult times, Yeah, you know, so. So that's been something that I've always tried to do to be a little more personal with people. And, and, and I hope they understand, you know, when I say, um, I'll, I'll pray for you. I, I add this tagline that says, <laughs> I go, and I mean that if I say, <laughs> I'll do it, I'll do it. I'll this do is it. not <laughs> just a nice little thing to say, you know, but, yeah. you know, yeah. to make you feel good. You put some action behind the words that you have. Yeah, yeah that's right. You know, well, and I, I agree. And I think we spend so much of our adult lives at work and it, it almost feels like there's sometimes a disconnect that we have to be some different person while we're at work as opposed to kind of our personal lives. And that's, that's not always the case. There, there are times for kind of the business relationships and things like that. But I mean, even just building those personal relationships go so far they they mean so much and you never know what kind of an effect you might leave on someone or the yeah. effect you might have yeah um and, and i think everyone's had that in their lives when i when i was applying to utah state that was one of the kind of the college exam questions or the the essay questions is what they were and it was called a lollipop moment and it was about this girl who she was she was starting out a new college she was super nervous she didn't know what to do she was standing in line and this random guy was walking around handing out lollipops Ooh. and just saying i hope you have a great day Wow. And she remembered that that just changed her whole day. And she met up with him. I think she ran into him in the halls or something like probably three years later. And she, she was like, wow, you changed, you changed my day. Like I, I had such a, a hard day that day. And he was like, I don't remember that at all. <laughs> He's like, and so you, you just never know. You never know what kind of an effect you might leave on someone That's and right. to, to try to separate the business from the personal. I think there are times for each, but building those relationships are so important right now. I think so too. And now's a prime time because there's so yeah. many that uh, yeah. need, uh, my, my wife is a hugger, mm -hmm. you know, and she, uh, she hugs everybody and, you know, working up with the, the, uh, young single adults, there's a lot of young women that need hugs and, you know, it's amazing how people will come by our house after they have left college. Yeah because they just love her to death. That's awesome. Yeah. <laughs> you guys are both just awesome. That's why I wanted to talk with you so much. Kind of a last question as far as kind of a job goes. If someone were kind of interested in joining your sales team, kind of being a part and working with you, what are some of the traits that you kind of look for in those people? One is a, to be a people person. And uh, so they're a good team player on the inside. And, and, and they're willing to put in the hours. I don't necessarily recommend this, but I'm generally the first to work and last to leave about every day. And maybe that's because I'm not as smart as some of the other guys, <laughs> you know, but, uh, I doubt that, but, <laughs> <laughs> but, um, I, I remember, and this story kind of illustrates it, that during the depression, some guy was he would go through the alleys trying to find anything he could take home, maybe to help his family. And he'd walk by this little, this warehouse and the door was open because it was hot. And, and so one day he stopped and he looked in 
and he noticed that they were assembling boxes. He had time on his hands, so he decided to go in and, and just start assembling boxes, and, and, it, and it passed the time. And uh, after a week, the manager asked some of the other guys, who's that guy assembling boxes? He's doing a great job. And they go, we don't know. We thought you just hired him, <laughs> you know? And, um, and so they did hire him after that because he was, he, he was assembling boxes faster than anybody else. And then pretty soon he moved up the ranks of management, you know? And I think that's the kind of guy or gal that we're looking for. Somebody who wants to take initiative, who wants to own it, who's willing to be humble enough to ask for help, but independent enough to be a thinker themselves. Mm -hmm. And and it's okay to come up with the wrong solution then uh, and presenting that to the boss, then to go to the boss with no solution and asking them to do it. You know, so that's, that's kind of my thoughts because this is not rocket science. What we do is kind of learning on the job in a sense. Um, but it's, uh, paying attention and taking initiative, you know, being somebody and, and somebody who comes into work every day and just doesn't go straight to their office and they go around and they say hi to everybody, mm-hmm. you know, and, uh, ask how they're doing. We take notice of people like that. Well, just to kind of close out lane, I like to kind of ask people, what is one kind of funny or humorous story? We kind of heard the one where you got, you got stuck in Abu Dhabi. Yeah. Is there any other kind of a funny work story that you have that you'd be willing to share with everybody? Yeah, I, uh, I was in China and we were traveling quite a bit, staying in different hotels. And, um, and so one night I went to bed about 1030 and I was so tired. And uh, well, like I say, we were staying in different towns, different hotels. And I, I got up to go to the bathroom. And of course, I was into my underwear and and uh, when I w- went through the bathroom door, I noticed that it locked, it shut behind me. And I go, bathroom doors don't do that. <laughs> but, but your hotel door does. Yeah. <laughs> and I'm, the next thing I know, I'm just standing in the hallway uh, in this hotel, you know, in my underwear. And, and I had to go to the bathroom so bad. I go, you know, I, I, I'm getting desperate and uh, I have choices, you know, use the stairwell or go downstairs in my underwear. And, <laughs> in your underwear. Get me. and I had looked, I swore I looked all over that, that floor for, a, a, you know, a hotel phone. And, uh, and I, I did find one. And so I called up and, and they brought up a key and I'm uh, sitting there in my <laughs> to my door kind of curled up in a ball just, you know? just waiting for someone to come and let you back into your room <laughs> this little Chinese gal she was so embarrassed you know but she's probably more embarrassed than I was yeah. <laughs> I'm sure that's not the craziest thing she's ever seen though no, uh, no. I, it might be up there yeah, <laughs> All right, so I hope you guys enjoy that interview with Lane. I know I really love getting to know him a little bit more and talking with him about his career. So always make time to make those personal efforts and reach out to those around you. Work as a team. Let's push together. And let's achieve more than we thought we could. Thanks for tuning in. Leave me a five-star review if you liked it. And make sure to follow the podcast for more. Catch you later. <laughs>